Friends, we are continuing today in our series called Facing Fear. We started this last week talking about how we live in a world full of fear and what are we supposed to do about that. We're focusing everything around our theme verse. I'd encourage you to pull out your bulletins and read this theme verse together. It's from 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. Join with me. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. We love because God first loves us. There is no fear in love. We see this idea that in God's love, there isn't fear. There's hope and peace and renewal. But we live in a world of anxiety. We live in a world of fear, and fear is used against us all the time. Not only do we have our own anxieties and our own fears, we talked about a lot of those last week, but it gets used against us because it's very effective. Fear is a great motivator. So advertisers and politicians and social media, the news, even the church, people love to use fear because it works. So we're going to talk about how we find hope in all of that. And today we're going to talk about this phrase, God-fearing. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. It's supposed to be good God-fearing Christians. And when I heard that as a kid, I thought, I'm supposed to be afraid of God? You keep telling me God is love and God loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. Why am I supposed to be afraid of God? That's confusing to me. So we're going to talk about what that means. Are we supposed to be afraid of God or not? Where does this phrase come from? I want to read a little bit more of this chapter of 1 John where we get our theme verse. This is a little bit earlier in the chapter. This is 1 John 4, starting in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love each other, because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love doesn't know God, because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice to deal with our sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, teach us this morning and we will listen. We struggle with anxiety and fear. And a lot of us have had fear when it comes to you and to the church. We don't feel like we measure up. We're afraid we're going to make mistakes. We're terrified of eternal consequences. We're not sure that we know what to do or that we can do right, even if we do know what it is. So God, help us today to understand what this means. How are we to fear you? What does that mean? And How do we find hope in the midst of it? God, be with us and use us. This is your time and we trust you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There's three things I want to talk about in all of this today. The first is I want to talk about how God motivates with love, but humans prefer fear. We're going to talk about what that word God-fearing actually means, and then finally, why should we care about any of this? That was always my question in seminary. I'd sit through preaching class and somebody would get up and preach and you know, the person next to me would go, well, I don't, it was a good sermon, but I don't really, I have some like, I don't know how to describe it. It just, something was missing. And I said, yeah, the, why should I care about this part? They're like, well, what do you mean? And I was, every sermon I would want to raise my hand, but this was too mean to say in class. So I wanted to raise my hand and go, so what? Like, that was really interesting, but so what? Why should I care about this? And seminary sermons were the worst because we just got done studying and reading all these theologians. We knew all the background in the Bible. So you get students that would get up, and I did it a lot of times myself, where I, we would unpack all the history behind the Exodus and the Old Testament and what this word in Hebrew means, and we give you all these incredible facts about everything. And then we'd say, amen. And everyone in the room would turn and go, okay, so what? What does that have to do with my life? When I walk out of here, how does this impact me in any way? So I want to talk about that today because this is one of those topics that eh, it's a hard time to figure out how does this impact my daily life? What does God-fearing have to do with me walking out of here and getting ready for work tomorrow? There's a, there's a quote. Well, hold on, I'm going to get to a second. The first thing we're talking about here is how God motivates with love while humans use fear. And the first question is why? If we're made in the image of God, why do we work so counter to how God works. If God uses love, why do we use fear? Well, the short answer is 
Because it works. It's effective. Fear is incredibly effective. I'm sure you have purchased something, made decisions, chosen something in your life, voted in a certain way because you were afraid of the consequences. Fear is incredibly effective. We've been using it forever. Fear is effective in church. It's effective in parenting. It's effective in coaching. I'll tell you, when I played football in high school, I was not afraid of anybody more than my football coaches. They were terrifying. If you did something wrong, man, they would come after you. If you couldn't remember how many feet were in a mile, you had to run all of them. It was terrifying. Fear is very effective. There's a quote from John Lennon that's always stuck with me. It says this, There are two basic motivating forces in life, fear and love. When we're afraid, we pull back from life. When we're in love, we open up to all that life has to offer with passion, excitement, and acceptance. All hope for a better world rests in the fearlessness and open-hearted vision of people who embrace life. Love opens us up. Fear closes us down. I'm sure you've seen someone who discovers a passion for something in their life, and when they tell that story, it's, it's like they've opened up. When someone falls in love, their, their face brightens up, and they tell you all these little stories. We open ourselves up to things. When we're afraid, we close everything down. Even our body language does that. When we're afraid, we make ourselves smaller. We avert our eyes. Fear closes us off. But it works. Love is the motivation that Christ used, however, not fear. As much as the church loves to use fear, Jesus never used fear. He never tried to scare anyone into following him. He never walked up to a sick person and said, hey, I'll heal you if you'll follow me first. He never said that. I'll give you something to eat if you go get 10 new followers for me. He didn't say any of that. He doesn't extort love from people. He doesn't scare people. Well, you should follow me because if you don't, I know what happens to you. He never says that to anyone. He doesn't scare people into following him. Christ always healed or offered food. He always helped people. And then he invited people to follow him. Love always came first. That's what Christ used to motivate people. It was love. It was always love. But religion, unfortunately, likes to use fear. Follow the rules or else. That's the idea we get from religion, especially over time. When I was in college, uh, I had a professor, or uh, sorry, a, a pastor that I really loved at this church I went to. Um, he was so engaging, always talked right to me, but he was a little fire and brimstone at the same time. Like his sermons got a little bit into like, you know, here are the consequences if you don't do these things. And I got more and more afraid of these eternal consequences. Well, coincidentally, at the same time, I was a philosophy major in college. And you do a lot of study of like, existential metaphysical things when you're in philosophy 101 you start at the very beginning how do i know that anything is real you always start with descartes i think therefore i am how do i know that i'm real how do i know i'm not living in a simulation how do i know this isn't all a dream you start with these big huge questions which are fun and great to talk about over coffee but when on sunday you're getting preached about these eternal existential consequences if you don't follow all the rules right and then you go to class on monday and you're wondering do i even exist start to have a little bit of a panic oh my gosh is this real and if it's real i better follow these rules because if i don't you know this person says i'm going to hell and this person says what if i just cease to exist I had never thought about that until I got into them some of these classes. They were like, well, if there's nothing after death, you just cease to exist. Try to contemplate nothingness, a professor told me. And I thought, okay, well, what a dumb assignment. That's easy. And so I sat there, and I tried to think of what nothingness would be like. And you, you can't do it. Your human brain can't comprehend what it's like to not exist. You just can't do it. Try it. Don't think about it for too long. But if you just think about how you cease to exist, it really messes with you. And you think, at the end, am I going to find out? Like, we always talk about that. When I get to heaven, I can't wait to ask God all these questions. i got to find out, was I right about this? Was I wrong about that? But if you just cease to exist, you never know. You never know you lived. You can't reflect back and remember. You just cease to exist. And it was terrifying. 
And so in that moment, I was getting it from all sides, from school, from church, everything. It was this existential dread, and it led to a lot of fear. And I thought, okay, I got to figure the answer out. I got to learn exactly what's right, exactly what's going to happen, and what I should do so that I don't just get blinked out of existence, or even worse, you know, get tortured for the rest of my life. That sounds horrible. Maybe I would rather cease to exist. I don't know. But I experienced a lot of this fear about these existential things. And we see a lot of people going through this as well. Whether they encounter it in a philosophy book they read when they're coming of age, or if they go to a church that uses fear to try to scare people into following because of these existential consequences, these eternal consequences, we have a lot of this fear. And because of that, a lot of people see God like this traditional authority figure, this judge that's going to use your time on earth and your decisions and send you either to heaven or to hell. We have this very dualistic way of looking at things, which, by the way, is not how the afterlife is portrayed in the Bible. Everybody went to Sheol, went to the land of the dead. We've changed it a lot over time as art and literature and movies and books and everything have taken it all these different directions. And now we see it like this judge. We see it like that show, The Good Place. Did y'all watch The Good Place with Ted Danson? I loved it, right? It's this idea about you go to the good place or the bad place when you die, very typical understanding of it. And they say, well, how do you know who goes to the good place and the bad place? And they've got a formula, and they put your life up there in every decision. It's like, you know, you let somebody cut in front of you in traffic, six points. You, you know, uh, saved a child from a fire, 10,000 points. You know, committed genocide, negative one million points. I mean, it's like they had like a scoring system for everything, and if you get enough points... You get into the good place. And a lot of us think that's how it works. Like there's some like divine accountant like, ooh, man, okay, Derek, Tennessee fan, minus 1,000 points. <laughs> so you thought I couldn't work it in. Derek is my uh, holy scapegoat. One day it's going to come back around. <sighs> Got to get ready for the hurt a and going to feel this season. <sighs> but we think that's how it works. We think God's keeping score, and we have these existential, eternal consequences that we have to be afraid of. And for so many of us, that's what religion is all about. What's going to happen when we die? Can I follow the rules to make sure I get into the good place and not? We're, we fear because we're guilty. It's like we're a drug addict, and God is the police that's going to show up and bust us. But the command to be perfect is impossible, and it's never what Christ required. Christ never demanded perfection. He never surrounded himself by the best of the best. In fact, he went down to the docks and found the worst of the worst. And those were his disciples. God always is confounding our expectations. God isn't here to bust us. God isn't the police that shows up to arrest us and take us to jail. Christ is our best friend walking with us, pulling us out of the gutter, checking us into rehab and walking with us through that hell on earth. Psalm 23 says, though I, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. God is with us in those moments. It doesn't say, you better do what I'm telling you or I'm going to send you to that valley of the shadow of death. But that's how a lot of us see God. You better do right or else. But in Scripture, we see that God is with us. God is a comforter. But it's a lot easier for many of us to see God as a punisher and a judge more than a comforter. Because we understand fear. We use fear a lot to motivate. And so a lot of times that leaves us seeing God through the lens of fear. Which doesn't help when we see the word God-fearing in Scripture a lot. This idea that we're supposed to be afraid of God. So let's talk about that. If God doesn't use fear to motivate us, what does God-fearing mean? Why do we see this fear of God in Scripture? Well, one of the most famous places we find that phrase is in Proverbs. The beginning of the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7, says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, which seems to imply that we should be scared of God. If we're looking for knowledge, we should fear God. That seems to be how we would understand that in English. The way that we understand that word fear in English, would seem to say, be scared, be afraid of God, terror. Those are the words that we would use to describe this. But there's a lot of things that that Hebrew word for fear can mean, depending on how it's used. It can talk about terror and fear in the way we understand that, world, that word, but a lot of times it's talking about awe or reverence or respect or wonder. It's not fear as in you're scared of something, 
but it's like standing before the Grand Canyon and the awe and the wonder that comes over you because it's so huge and so majestic. There's a little bit of fear associated with that because it's so big and it's so grand. And so you see fear linked to it, but it's not the same as being scared of something. Awe, reverence, respect, wonder, these are the ways that we see this word used a lot more, and especially in this way. Reverence for the Lord would be a much better way to, to translate this than fear of the Lord because of how we understand fear today, where there's a new horror movie that comes out every week. We love the concept of fear, of being scared of things. But that's not really what the, what the author of the Proverbs was talking about here. Proverbs is wisdom literature. It's all about understanding the wisdom of God, teaching us the wisdom of God. If you read the book of Proverbs, it's like a bunch of fortune cookies. It's all these tiny little sayings, these little truisms, these little wisdom sayings. It's all about trying to help us to understand the wisdom of God. Why do we have fear or reverence or respect for the Lord? So that we can gain wisdom and knowledge. The Proverbs is connecting that reverence, that fear, that respect for God with gaining knowledge, with gaining wisdom. And I know that because of what the full verse says. I just read half of it. The full verse, Proverbs 1-7, says this. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it doesn't say fools aren't scared of God. It says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, who would despise wisdom? That sounds silly. You never describe yourself that way. Well, here's what you need to know about me. I really hate wisdom. It's not for me. Smart people, ugh, no thanks. No one would say that about themselves. But I think what this is getting at is people who try to lean only on themselves. They try to do it all themselves. They don't ask for help. They're not trying to learn or open themselves up to new ideas. They're always trying to be right. They're always trying to be in control. That is the fool who despises wisdom and instruction. They don't seek wisdom and instruction out. They think they have it all. We're not supposed to lean on our own understanding. And I know that because two chapters later in Proverbs, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's this idea that we are meant to have awe and reverence and respect for God and the law of God because of the wisdom that can come from God. And the fool disregards all that, thinks he has all the answers, and just tries to go it alone and misses out on that wisdom. So it's not saying you should be afraid of God. It's saying you should have respect for what God can do in your life. You should have respect for the wisdom and the knowledge that God can bring. That's what that fear of the Lord is all about. We follow the word of God and the law of God, not because we're afraid of the consequences of what happens if we don't, but because we know the wisdom that it can bring. We know that it leads to that abundant life here on earth. That's what Christ was always talking about, life here on earth. We see that again and again. This phrase, the fear of the Lord, isn't about being afraid of God. It's about having reverence for the Lord because that's what leads to wisdom. So what do we do with any of this? This is all interesting, but why should I care? Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize and celebrate that this is good news. Because you may be in that place where you were raised in a tradition that tried to scare you into heaven. A lot of people I know have had that experience where they were scared by the church. They were condemned, they felt judged, they were told, follow these rules or else. And that was so much of the teaching that a lot of people see God as this scary authority figure. A lot of people have no trouble understanding fear of the Lord. They've got it. They are afraid of the Lord. They are afraid of hell. They are afraid of those consequences, and that is what frames their understanding of God and religion from top to bottom. But we see in Scripture that's not how God works. God is love, and there is no fear in love. That's what our theme verse is all about. There is no fear in love. Perfect love, which is God's love, drives out fear. Anyone who knows fear does not know God. Anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God. That's what 1 John keeps saying again and again. Even at that time, this was being misunderstood. So the first thing I think we do is we celebrate that God is a God of love, not a cruel judge who can't wait to punish you, not something to be feared, but something to be revered. God is perfect love, and perfect love drives out fear and makes us whole. The problem with this is that we often see the world as transactional and consequential. We're familiar with this. You do good, you get rewarded. 
you do bad, you get punished. It's how school works. It's how sports works. It's how parenting works in a lot of ways. We're really familiar with that. It's how the law, the legal system in our country works. You do good, you don't really get rewarded in the legal system, but if you do bad, you get punished. We're comfortable with this. We're familiar with this. We understand that. But this is so not really how God's love works. God's love is so much bigger than that. The kingdom of God transcends the way that we see things. God's love is not about this transaction. God's love and God's will has got to be so much bigger than, here's a list of rules, follow them, and you get to go to the good place, disobey them, and you get to go to the bad place. Look, what a boring idea of creation if that's all it is, right? If we've got like kindergarten disciplinary as, this, as the whole idea behind creation. I made this whole system. Why? Because I love for people to follow rules. Isn't that a weird thing to believe about God? I'm going to create everything. And I'm going to create humans in my own image, my crowning achievement. And I'm going to make them imperfect. And then I'm going to give them a rule to follow. And when they don't follow the rules, like I created them to be imperfect, I'm going to get mad and punish them forever. Well, doesn't that seem like an inherently broken system? We're not perfect. We know that we're not perfect. Why would we think that God is expecting us to be perfect? That's not how we were made to be. God gave us free will. God loves us. And in Scripture, God never shows up and was like, Hey, Peter, I got a list of all the things you did wrong last week. You better start saying those Hail Marys. Jesus never says that. He says, Peter, do you love me? I know you betrayed me. I know you denied me three times in my hour of need, but do you love me? And feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? That's the question he asks him three times because that's what God cares about. Do you love me? Then come and see. Come and follow. It's not about being perfect. Jesus built his church upon the rock of Peter, who was probably the worst of all of them. He denied and betrayed his best friend in his hour of need. That's about as bad as it gets. In Dante's seven levels of hell, Judas is at the bottom as the betrayer. Well, Peter was a pretty big betrayer too in that moment. And yet what does Jesus do? He doesn't condemn him. He doesn't cast him aside. He calls him back in and says, Peter, I still want to build my church upon you. You're still the rock. I still love you. Do you love me? Then we've got work to do. God is about love, not fear. God's love is so much bigger than anything that we can understand. Our focus isn't about getting into heaven. It's about bringing heaven to earth. That's what we see in the Lord's Prayer. Christ was trying to teach us this in the prayer that he gave us. On earth as it is in heaven. We're meant to manifest heaven here on earth. The new heaven and the new earth comes to earth. When you read Revelation, we don't go to heaven. Heaven comes to earth. God has always been about making the kingdom of God real here, making love real here, living in community. But so much of religion has turned it into this system of rules. You have to follow perfectly because God's keeping score, and if you don't get enough points, you're punished forever. That's not the story we see in Scripture. We see a story of love. And so, friends... If you are one who is constantly afraid of eternal consequences and that's the way you see God, I would encourage you today to embrace the love and the grace of God. God who is love and there is no fear in love. We love others because God first loved us. That's how we walk in the way that leads to life. It's how we find abundant life here on earth. It's how we find that wisdom that the Proverbs are talking about. It's how we live into who we were created by God to be to bear the image of God, which is an image of love and not fear. Let's pray. God, we come to you today seeking to change our perspective. So much of our life understands the way fear and consequences work, and so much of the history of the church has used fear to motivate people, to scare them into doing the right thing, and yet you never did that. You would give warnings, but you would never scare people. You came to bring love and hope. You walked with people when they made the biggest mistakes is when you forgave them the most. God, help us to reverse our expectations, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by remembering that you are love. You came to bring love, and you call us to share love with others. 
So may we release that burden if we're carrying it, that fear that we're not good enough, that fear that we're not going to measure up, that fear that we're not in, that fear that our mistakes are going to define our life. God, help us to let that go, to receive that forgiveness and that justification as we are made new. God, help us to be that new creation today, living in hope and love and not fear. God, help us, for this goes against so much of what we know and so much of what we understand. But we know that we trust in you, and you are a God of love. In your name we pray. Amen.